Welcome, welcome everyone to another BirdFest online session where we will be chatting about the birds and the plants during this great backyard bird count. My name is Carly Rhodes and I'm with the Environmental Science Center over in Washington. And we are very fortunate to still put on this great BirdFest event for the fifth year in a row with sponsorship from the city of Burien to help you learn about what's in your backyard, particularly the birds, how you can help these birds and how you can also just appreciate them. And plants are a great way that are attracting birds and they rely on them as much as we do. So we're gonna open up this conversation about birds. We are in this online format, but even so, we still want to acknowledge that we are somewhere <laughs> on land and over in Washington, where the Environmental Science Center operates, we are particularly in South King County. And this is land of, this is land we want to acknowledge for itself. And this is also land that since time immemorial, there have been many people here. The Coast Salish people are the people of this land. So we want to acknowledge the land itself. We want to acknowledge the tribal members of many of those tribes from the past, the present and the future. And we acknowledge and are grateful for all of the information that they've been sharing. They have been stewards of this land and continue to be. And we are hoping to learn more from them, with them, uh, to share this information and to help be stewards ourselves of this land. Plants have been here <laughs> a long time and the native people have their own language for these plants different than the plants we're gonna share as common names or even Latin names that we'll share today. Um, so we're working to learn more about the local native lands or native language, which I you know, hope most of you are trying to do too. That is the shoot seat out here. And we are definitely excited to learn more about that. So today we are just gonna have a plant chat. If you have some questions about plants or birds, you're welcome to write some questions in and I'll be watching those. I also have some naturalists who are joining me. So you're not just talking to me, you're talking to some great naturalists um, who are with us as well. So I have um, Ed Dominguez who is joining us today. And let's see if we can get Ed on here, have you got your video on, Ed? I hear you. <laughs> um, we have Ed Dominguez, who is a naturalist of the region. We also have um, Orion Grant, who is going to be speaking with us as well. Oh, let's see, Ed, I think I've got your video. I can see your image, but I can't see your video. Um, it says the host has stopped the video, so I can't start it without your uh, permission. That sounds terrible. <laughs> May I have permission, please? And that's yeah, I... for me, Carly. Uh, I'll need permission. So let it, let us in, please. Let us. Let us I in. know. And usually it's so easy for me to do that. Um, Is there a secret me? password? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very special um, birding yeah, password. That's why Okay, here we go. Let me, uh, there we go. Too many little buttons on the screen in the car. <laughs> Yay, here I am. <laughs> yeah, we have Ed Dominguez, um, who's, who is probably somebody you saw recently if you joined us um, to share information. It's good to see Hello. you. So, sorry about that. And we also have Orion Grant, one of um, ESC's naturalists, uh, who's going to be sharing some information as well. Hey folks, thanks so much, Carly. Yeah, it's good to see you all. Happy to be here. Thank you very much to Carly and the Environmental Science Center. I always enjoy being a part of their great programs for education and conservation, and it's great to be here again. Awesome, and such a privilege thanks. for me to join. Um, Ed, thanks again for making the space for me and Carly as well for hosting today. Um, I'm glad we didn't get snowed in. So lucky that we got Zoom for the first time. So, you know, thanks a lot, folks. Yeah. Yes. And you can see we're all in different places. I actually am out here so I can do a bird count afterwards. And since we're talking about plants, I tried to be as close as I could. Um, but Ed, we were talking about birds and plants earlier. I'm wondering if maybe you want to share some of those special relationships that you know they share. 
Yeah, you know, our, our uh, birds and our plants, native plants, <clears throat> share an incredible relationship that goes back 12,000 years. So let's all take a little visual journey back in time. You've all heard of the ice ages, you know, a, a period of time called the Pleistocene uh, era where um, starting 2.6 million years ago, uh, we, the earth entered a colder phase and uh, we had glaciers advancing down the mountains and we also had a continental ice sheet that came down from Canada. And a big tongue of that ice sheet came over Puget Sound, completely blocked the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, the sea level was um, many uh, miles further west than it was now. And a big tongue of ice came down and reached uh, just south of Olympia. It's known now retrospectively as the, the Puget Lobe of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. At that time, at its maximum, uh, downtown Seattle had 3,000 feet of ice uh, over our heads. So the ice was as thick over Seattle as the elevation of Snoqualmie Pass, if you can imagine that. In fact, it was so deep, one lobe of the Puget Lobe went eastward and actually headed east out towards North Bend and pushed up a big terminal moraine out there that I-90 has to do a dog leg around to head east called Grouse Ridge. Anyway, we had a lot of ice over our heads. That ice started melting about 14,000 years ago and somewhere around 12,000 to 11,000 years ago, the land was once again exposed here in the Puget Sound area. Now imagine what that looked like. You've all seen images of a glacier, you know, a white ice front. There's braided streams coming out from underneath the glacier. Uh, they're brown with uh, rock sediment, so it looks like chocolate milk is flowing out everywhere from underneath the glacier. They're very windy places because there's no trees to break up wind. So winds are blowing a lot of dust around from the snout of the glacier where all that rock flower is. And you get your first insects that are flying from the south up to get drinks of water from the base of the melting glacier. No plants on the ground, no anything, just you know all of the debris of, of buried rock. Now, you get birds flying up from the south to eat the insects. And the birds have been feeding on plants that are further south. And while they're feeding on the insects at the base of the glacier, well, they typically poop, as birds do. And if they have some seeds from native plants, guess what gets deposited at the snout of the glacier? So for the last 11 to 12,000 years, we've had those first native plants that came from warmer regions to the south that started sprouting. And all insects use plants at, in some part of their life cycle. So insects either started laying their eggs on the leaves or stems of plants, or uh, larvas started eating, nibbling the leaves, or adult plants, uh, uh, insects use those. Birds came up and ate the insects. So the insects have a sort of an institutional memory, as it were, or an instinct for the last 11, 12,000 years, they know what plants have been most successful for laying their eggs for their young to a larva to feed on, to pupate, to develop into adults. And over millennia, that cycle has been repeated over and over. So the insects are hardwired to come to the plants that they've used for millennia. And then the birds, which feed on the insects, come up and take advantage of that. And there have actually been studies done showing they compared two, two plants, one native, one non-native, two trees. They took um, the Oregon white oak or the Gary Oak, Quercus garii it's called, and found out how many different insect species use the Gary Oak for some part of their life cycle, either laying eggs on it or feeding on it or what, what may be. And it turned out there was well over 500 different insect species that use a Gary Oak. Uh, they contrasted that with a non-native tree, a ginkgo tree, although way back in the Jurassic we did have ginkgo trees around here, but not recently. And only 50 species of insects use the ginkgo tree. So insects are adaptable, they're opportunistic, and they'll take advantage of whatever plants are around, but they've really been hardwired to use the native plants that first appeared here 11 to 12,000 years ago. So that's a lot of millennial memory to, to undo. So 
insects rely on native plants more than they do non-natives. And of course, the birds rely on the insects. So we're really, you know, proponents of using native plants, the plants that have been here since the ice retreated um, for any work in landscaping and gardening, in restoration of areas that have been taken over by invasives like Himalayan blackberry or English holly or English ivy. Uh, because the insects really have depended on those and will use those to a greater degree than non-natives. So um, natives are always best if you can do it. Now I have some non-native plants in my yard and you know I've got some uh, flowering uh, camellias that are blooming right now and my hummingbirds taking advantage of that and liking the, the blossoms that are on there. But, but by and large, if you can use a larger percentage of native plants, it's better for the birds because it's better for the insects that the birds depend on. That's awesome. And Ed, I just wanted to open up the uh, chat for folks as they are here for attending. Um, feel free to ask questions and kind of yeah. comment stuff as well. And uh, that's a, a great kind of segue for me. You know, my first thought is what are the first, you know, now endemic species that we started to see kind of re replace or at least habitat that zone, right? That kind of Vashon glaciation that we saw at the end of that period. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind are probably asters, those separate varieties, and some of the salvia variety, like sage and that. But, Ed, what are we thinking about some of those natives and endemics that were first here in that zone as soon as that glaciation kind of retreated? Um, I don't know the specific plants that came at that, that you know, based on, say, the Mount St. Helen eruption back in 1980. There were a lot of studies done on the first plants that recolonized. That area was completely wiped out. What are the first plants that started appearing? Um, plants like fireweed started popping up. So um, we can perhaps uh, extrapolate back in time that maybe some of those pioneer plants were some of the first ones that, that started sprouting at the, snouts of the snout of the glacier. And then as more and more insects and more birds came and deposited droppings that had seeds in them, you get a greater and greater variety of plants. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And that kind of dictates the work that, um, you know, that I do on, uh, aside from working with ESC as a permaculturist and, you know, as a permaculture design specialist, I'd like to look at systems uh, that have not only maintained, but that have been able to replace themselves and do that without human intervention. And, um, you know, what we're talking about a lot of the time are these endemic species that have not just competed, but have established themselves, you know, from trial through tribulation, you know, time and time again, like we've talked about. And uh, we now have these, you know, these new guys on the, on the street, these Rubus Armenias and the, you know, English Ivies of the world that are trying to do their best to outcompete, you know? And um, we think about what we have to do, right, to maintain this ecosystem. Eventually, blackberry and English ivy in a few thousand years are going to be a native species here in Washington State. We're not going to get them all out. But in the meantime, you know, we want to maintain that biodiversity. We want to give those, you know, endemic species that have done their job and have established themselves and have maintained the ecosystem a fighting chance. So a lot of the work that, you know, I go into and conversations I have with clients and, you know, other scientists is just that. How do we maintain these systems? How do we mitigate the damage that's been done by, you know, non-native species in our ecosystem. And like you said so well, Ed, how do we look back in time and see what were the things that have either happened that we can see that have replaced and kind of challenged the diversity of this ecosystem? And also, you know, what's going to do its best here? So I really, I really love the idea then, how do we help our pollinators? Like what, <laughs> those little guys that we think about and that we enjoy so much, what are those types of plants that we can put in the ground to, you know, not just invite, you know, those pollinators to our yards and to our, to our green space, but again, just build that kind of diversity back that our ecosystem has been lacking in some cases. Yep. You know, the, our native Gary Oak tree that I mentioned, um, there's been some paleobotany studies being that have been done for a while now, and there's a speculation that they see that remains of Gary Oaks and acorns in areas that were concentrated, and the speculation is, is 
the Gary Oaks are quite common in the Willamette Valley. And the further, more southerly you go, um, the more variety of oaks you see. I grew up in Northern California and there's dozens of different species of both the red oak and white oak and live oak family. But there's some conjecture that maybe as native peoples uh, inhabited this area that they traded for some acorns from oaks that grew in Oregon, traded for them, brought them up here and established them. And um, because the acorns were an important food, um, basically kind of transplanted uh, some of the Gary Oaks to here. And so there was human intervention possibly responsible. Um, in Seward Park, uh, on the south, sunny south shore, there's a row of Gary Oaks, and I know there's been speculation as to native peoples may have planted those and tended them and kept them reproduced over millennia. So um, that's an interesting conjecture. Did plants like the Gary Oak uh, arrive here of their own, or was there some, uh, you know, human transportation involved trading with with uh, Indian indigenous peoples further south where the oaks are more prevalent. We don't know, but it's kind of fun to try and go back in time and imagine what it might have been like as the landscape was first being colonized by plants. And then with the arrival of humans, how did they impact what we now call as native or non-native? Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I like to think about cultivation in that process um, that's gone on for you know thousands of years, kind of echoing back to what Carly said at the very beginning, now, the work that's been done and the uh, stewardship that's been done on this land here in the Puget Sound goes back thousands of years and generations, you know, and many Coast Salish tribes, again, through their own trials and tribulations have figured out ways and systems to create a balance and equanimity uh, with these uh, plants, some of which, like we've talked about, may not be native, quote unquote, but have been cultivated and brought into this environment over time, mm -hmm. slowly. Um, I think what we what we are all kind of thinking about nowadays is, you know, how do we get away from these, you know, monocultures or, you know, hegemonous types of systems that are replacing what types of diversities or what types of, you know, multitudes that we've had before of plant species. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's such a brilliant point. Ed. It's a brilliant one. And there were people here, I think some of the latest archeological discoveries um, in some caves show that there were, there were human beings here, even during the time of the, the Great Lake Missoula Ice Age flood, so we're talking about 14,000 years ago. So there were people here as the as the the glacier lobes retreated, and you know they may have very likely have had some impact as to what plants were growing, as you know they depended on uh, plants as part of their food supply. So Absolutely. it's interesting to speculate. Yeah, there's there's a mutualism there that can't deny either between yeah. us and these trees or the birds it's just a, mm -hmm. it's a consistent kind of effort to not outcompete one another but create a system where we can survive and sustain with one another um, that's that's what nature gets right it seems like we kind of mess that up whenever we get the chance but uh, yeah it, it's such a delicate balance like the old analogy of a spider web and you know if a human being twangs one one bit of the web the whole thing vibrates and has a response to that interference. So yeah, we need to be mindful about it and make sure that we're trying to keep things in the balance that's the other creatures depend on it. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of the birds um, around here who like to eat certain things. You know, how same things with humans, we like to eat certain things. Um, but we have a whole lot more options. <laughs> we can get in our cars and go different places. I mean, as the plants are changing, as climate change is affecting the plants and when, when things are blooming, um, how, how do you um, either see some of the transitions with the birds adapting or how have you seen, you know, in the past, like, do you know about certain birds that were more specialized with seeds, but have been broadening, like, you know, broadening their diets to kind of, you know, get more um, nutrition if they're lacking it from some anatomical issue of us putting in houses or just uh, the seasons changing and having a food change? Well, you know, birds are adaptable and, um, 
they'll adapt to whatever food supply they can find that will sustain them. So they're pretty good at that. And they're also good at transporting themselves because they have wings. So if food source in one area dries up or is gone, they'll go somewhere else to try and find food sources. But there are limits to uh, how much they can adapt. And particularly with climate change and the climate getting warmer further and further north, many bird species that were south of us are making their way north and moving into habitat that's already been established by birds that are native to this area. And that can result in conflicts um, both for territory and for food supplies. And sometimes the native birds have just decided it's better to move on than fight. And so they'll, they'll leave the area to move somewhere else. Maybe they'll survive, maybe they won't. But it does, it does present challenges. And in terms of projections of climate change and warming, what the landscape will look like and what, you know, Audubon has, National Audubon has some uh, map speculating different ranges of birds and how much further north that they're going to be. And there's also groups that have uh, talked about plants and how much further southerly species of plants could move northward. Plants that are, you know, down in the southern Willamette Valley or even southern Oregon like Roseburg, you know, in 60 years, might have moved, you know, made their way up into uh, the, the uh, Portland area and across the Columbia River. So climate change is very real in terms of different populations of plants and birds and insects shifting. And birds are flexible and adaptable, but sometimes if they're forced out of areas or put in too heavy of competition with other species that are already established for limited food supplies, that can be a problem. So yeah goes back to climate change and um, hopefully we're globally we're going to be working harder to solve that problem now that at least we have a new administration that's more sensitive to the needs of the earth. And on that same note we have a question about you know what can people do uh, to help the birds through plants or just help the plants in general um, in their area like what different things do both of you think about for that? Um, go ahead, Orion. I'll let you lead off and then I'll... That's great. Yeah. I, real quick, just to kind of bring both of those together. Um, I'm looking at yesterday a big mess of ivy on a tree and it's just starting to fruit this time of the year. And I watch a, I think it's Migratorius, the uh, American Robin, fly down and eat one of those delicious fruits and just, just enjoy as many as they could, right? And those are packed full of fat. And uh, those are a great alternative to a, a native or a, another endemic type of fruit. So um, I got to see this process happening firsthand, right? Where two species that might be out competing or replacing those native species are just doing their thing, uh, finding ways to survive. So, you know, what I think of in response to that is, okay, we all have a right to be here, but I'd like to give a number of my natives and endemic species a fighting chance by creating those zones or pockets where they can thrive. And um, the best way for me to do that is with a rain catchment garden at my home or just a pollinator garden um, that really focuses on a number of those endemic species that work together. And uh, generally for me, that's gonna be um, some sage, lavenders, again, um, you know, just natives that we're talking about like blue bo blossom and that kind of stuff that has the chance to bloom throughout the year and be a food source for not just our birds, but some of our insects as well, which make up that essential part of the food system. So um, yeah, that's my, my first and probably uh, best response is to create those spaces either on your own property or with your community where those pollinators and those birds have a chance to thrive around those edge zones. Um, and yeah, just let those, let those critters have a chance to um, get to a, a source of food that's endemic and that, you know, has a chance to thrive its own in its own way, and yeah, yeah, that's what I've got as far as best best practices. What are we thinking? Well, you know, this time of year, I'm looking out and it's snowy. It's February, and thinking about your comment, Ryan, on berries. You know, um, snowberry, Symphocarpus alba, is a great native shrub that has white berries, and this time of year, it can be an important player in uh, bird nutrition. 
You know, in the berry world, um, there's varying degrees of sugar in berries. And roughly most berries that are red or orange or purple are higher in sugar. And they tend to ripen earlier in the fall or the winter. And they're used, of course, by birds because they're tasty and they have a lot of sugar. The, the, the snowberry is a white berry and has a much lower sugar content. So it's not the first choice of birds. It's not as palatable, doesn't have as much uh, carbohydrate energy in it, but it has a longer shelf life. And by this time of year, most of the berries that are red or, or purple or orange have gone bad. You know, the cold weather sets in. First of all, the sugars ferment, and then it's great fun to watch um, the robins and the uh, waxwings get drunk, intoxicated, drinking the fermented berries. But then the, the sugars go rancid and the berries are no longer, you know, palatable or nutritious. This time of year, when, you know, late January and February, this is where plants like snowberry come into play because the less lower sugar content means the berry is still viable as food. You could think of it by saying it has a longer shelf life than the purple or red berry. So right now, if you have snowberries planted in your yard like I do that have white berries on them, I watch the birds and, and they're, they're feasting on it. It might not be their first choice because they're not as sugar laden or as tasty, but when pickings get slim, you know, in the heart of winter, they provide nutrition that can keep birds going. So that's a great choice for, you know, a shrub in the yard that's going to be very valuable for birds as I'm looking out in the snow right now. Yeah, that's, and just that's as, really as Orion, as Orion yeah. said, you know, diversity, you know, monocultures are not, not good for, for our wildlife, birds, insects, what may be it. And lawns especially are the worst. I mean, a lawn is a monoculture that doesn't provide a lot for, for most animals or birds. So if you can use native plants, but a diversity of plants, some native, some may, maybe non-native, that's fine, but have a diversity and have it be, as Orion said, if you can more self-sustaining, like a rain garden that doesn't need to have excessive amounts of water and especially doesn't need to have fertilizer, which ends up running off and entering the storm drains and getting into our lakes and rivers and, and causing problems with algae blooms. So, you know, diversity is, nature is diverse. And so plant a variety of different, different kinds of plants in your yard. Yeah, I agree on all those points. They're they're wonderful, and uh, you know, I also think about the people who don't have a yard because sometimes they feel like they're left out <clears throat> of the situation. Um, but you can still help birds and plants um, as well. If you have a car, um, you can have your car washed at the car wash versus doing it in your yard to have the chemicals go down the street like Ed was talking about storm water. It's a huge way that we can all make a difference yeah. because there are birds in the water. If they're not in the backyard, we have plenty in Puget Sound. Uh, you know, you, every time we hit our brakes with the car, a little bit of brake dust comes off. So um, carpooling is another big way that we can help um, with that. And even when you go for a walk, if you see a bunch of leaves and stuff around a storm drain, you know, you can move it out of the way, put it back on the lawn, pick up, put in a bag, put in a compost bin, because that all clogs um, the storm drains as well, um, you know. And you can count birds, like for the great backyard bird count, yeah. which is happening right now to, to help people learn about um, birds and where they are. So I feel so happy and um, grateful that I'm able to be here among friends, among mentors, sharing this information. And it's only been 30 minutes, but we covered a lot. <laughs> so yeah. I, um, I hope to create some more of these environments where we can just have these natural chats um, throughout the year and not just be a one-time thing. Uh, so I, I definitely want to thank you both for coming in and sharing your knowledge and your passion, which I can see it and feel it. So um, thank you for that. Thank you, Carly. Thank you very much, Orion. Great sharing time with you. It was a pleasure, Ed. We need an hour. That was just the. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we need more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carly.
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us and for caring and sharing this information with others. This is, this is how this works. Um, so again, uh, I just can't thank you enough. And if you're out and about, go birding and go planting because they go hand in hand. Yep. <laughs> thank you all. See you later. Bye-bye.